so the next speaker is me. And so I'm, I'm going to introduce myself. I didn't, I didn't trust Paul to do it because he makes up stuff sometimes. sometimes. But uh, no, I'm, I'm, so Brian Stagg, I did my medical school and residency here at University of Utah and uh, just really loved it here. And it's great to see so many of my, uh, my mentors here. Um, just respect and learn so much from all of you and really grateful to be here. I went to uh, Michigan and did a healthcare delivery research fellowship for two years after residency. And then I did a glaucoma fellowship at Duke after that. And then I've been back here and I actually just hit five years on faculty here, um, which it's gone by quick. It makes me feel, you know, <laughs> time's gone by really quick for sure. And uh, uh, really happy to be here. I do uh, research and, and clinic and surgery. And my research is really focused around uh, healthcare delivery for glaucoma, improving decision-making for glaucoma, um, basically trying to make sure that patients get the care that they need and, and not things that they don't need. And today I'm gonna to be talking about, oh, interesting fact. Yeah, so interesting fact, interesting fact I was gonna do is that as a resident, I lived in a duplex and the person who shared the wall with me was Jeff Petty, who, who was the residency program director at the time, who's awesome, you know, I, I love Jeff. Uh, but I don't necessarily recommend sharing a wall with your residency program director uh, during residency. It was, it, you know, there were good things, and then some things made it kind of stressful, too. I felt like I should be studying, like, sitting on my porch, like, reading the, the BCS books. But, um, but it, was, it, was a, it was a good experience. Um, so, uh, so today I'm talking about uh, delay in identification of glaucoma progression due to current uh, visual field testing patterns in the United States. So um, I'm going to give a kind of a short overview on uh, glaucoma and visual field testing for glaucoma, and then dive into a specific project that uh, I did recent that we did recently. So uh, we've we've talked a lot about glaucoma today. I hope you know. Raise of hands from the residents. Who's bored of glaucoma by now? No one raised their hands. That's right. Good, <laughs> good. Back there in the back. Yeah. If Sean, if Sean Colin were paying attention, he would have raised his hand, but Sean Collin, sorry, I call him Colin. Uh, but uh, so some people with glaucoma, so glaucoma makes you lose uh, vision slowly and you often don't notice it as, as Zach talked about earlier. But some people that we see for glaucoma, we diagnose with glaucoma, their glaucoma keeps getting worse even when they're being treated. And, uh, you know, studies vary on, on what percent of people that is. It's, it's somewhere between five and 30%. Um, but I think that these are really the people that we need to pay attention to. Uh, identifying who these people are is one of the most important things we do as eye doctors, because these are the people who uh, are gonna really develop disability from glaucoma and really go blind from glaucoma. And so, uh, one way that we watch for progression is we use structure measures, uh, mostly OCT, watching the structure of the nerve. But the other way that we do that is with visual field monitoring. And this is really the, the main way, the only way that we watch people's vision with glaucoma is and to see if it's getting worse. So we use these visual field tests. Most people use a test called the Humphrey visual field, which is um, from Zeiss. And what happens with these tests is uh, this is this is an, a report. So the patient looks in kind of a big white bowl, and then a light flashes at all of these different points here. So all of these numbers here represent points where the light's flashing, and uh, then the lights get dimmer and dimmer at each of those points. And there are a lot of different algorithms, different ways to evaluate that, but they get dimmer and dimmer, and you you find the point where the person can't see that dot anymore. And so. And this is really, I think, part of it to get around that, uh, you know, the remodeling we were talking about earlier, where you don't realize that what you're not seeing, you have to shine those little dots in those in those specific points. Um, and so you end up with a bunch of different points all ar around here and numbers that rec represent how much they deviate from the normal. And so we do that visual field test, we do it to diagnose glaucoma, but then we also do it to monitor glaucoma. So we have them repeat that test periodically and that's, you know, how often do you do it? That's, that's kind of the point of my talk today. We have them repeat that test, and then we look to see if it's getting worse. 
And if it's getting worse, then we say, your eye pressure isn't low enough. We need to lower your eye pressure even more. And so there are kind of two main ways that we look for progression. Um, one is called a, a, an event based progression. So that's looking for additional points where you know they could see these points before, but now they can't. So that could be progression. And then the other way we look for progression is, is trend-based. So over here, there are a few numbers that are different ways to uh, summarize how their performance across all of the points. So the VFI, visual field index, and mean deviation are, I think, the two main ones for looking for progression. And so that's kind of like a summary statistic of how their whole visual field performed. So you can look at the change of those over time, and that's that's what we call trend-based progression. So uh, our statistic, and so both of those ways actually, there there have been a number of studies that have shown that both of those ways perform very similarly. So as clinicians, we look at both, but statistically across populations, there's not a big difference. Um, like if one shows up, most often the other shows up as well. Um, that doesn't mean for residents that you can stop looking for it, but for population purposes, uh, they, they perform very similarly. So our ability to identify progression depends on four things as people are doing these visual field tests over and over again. One is the rate of progression. So you can imagine um, thinking about the mean deviation. If at one point it is like minus two and you progress really quickly and you go to minus 12, that rate of progression would be pretty easy to identify statistically. Whereas if it, you go from minus two to minus three, that's harder to pick up. Um, the time between the tests. So if the tests are in really, sh really close temporally, it's harder to identify progression. Whereas if they're more spread out, it's, it's easier statistically. And the variability of mean deviation over time. So the problem with the visual field test is that it's a, a subjective test. The person presses the button as the lights flash. And uh, because of that, there's a lot of test retest variability in it. Um, and so even if they do it, repeat the test that same day or the next day, it'll probably be a different value. And that doesn't mean that the disease has changed. It's just that our measurement is imperfect. And so some patients have high variability. Some patients have lower variability. Um, and that amount of variability makes it different. So um, one thing that's interesting is that uh, the worse the disease is, the higher the variability is. Um, and so patients with worse disease have more variability. It's harder to identify progression. And then uh, the fourth thing that influences our ability to identify progression is how many tests they do. So if you do more tests, you have more data points. Statistically, you're better able to identify progression. And uh, I'm going to show an example of this. So this, this is a, you know, a simulated patient, and uh, so two patients actually. So the blue dot there is low variability and the green dot is high variability. And so these two simulated patients, they both start out at um, a mean deviation of minus 10, which is moderate glaucoma. And the black line represents both of them are actually progressing at a constant rate. Um, and that rate is the same. The dots represent the tests. So they're starting out at minus 10, but when they do the visual field test, it won't actually be minus 10. There's some variability around that based on the, on the test variability. And so we do a test uh, at time zero, and then we wait a year, we do another test. Patient with high variability, it looks like, wow, maybe they've progressed a lot, but we say, oh, maybe, you know, maybe they're not. And uh, that goes on for several years. And then at four years, the patient with low variability, uh, we're able to say like, oh, they actually are progressing. And in this case, the definition of progression is a, a slope greater than zero or less than zero. And so we're able to identify that progression. And then that might go on for several years. And because of that huge variability in the high variability patient, it takes nine years to identify progression. Um, so this begs the question, how often do we do visual field tests? And a lot of, a lot of my work is, uh, a lot of the research I've done is around that. So the American Academy of Ophthalmology in the preferred practice pattern recommends visual field testing at least once per year. Um, patients with high variability probably actually need it more often than that, um, but at least once a year is a good place to start. 
So I recently did a study where we used a nationwide claims database. So it was uh, like 160 million patients across the United States. Um, and we identified patients with glaucoma. And then we looked at glaucoma, those, those patients with glaucoma to see how often they were actually getting visual field tests um, from 2008 to 2017. And the findings on this study were, were pretty striking. So more than three quarters of patients received less than one visual field test per year. Um, so the AAO recommends at least once per year and more than three quarters of patients weren't getting that. The median time between visual field tests was uh, about 1.6 years. And then the interquartile range went from 1.1 to, to just over three years. Um, and so, you know, that means that 25% of patients were getting a visual field test three or fewer or three or more years in between. And 25% uh, had more than 1.1 than years in between tests or less than 1.1 years between tests. And so, uh, so this study was, was pretty striking to me, showing that, you know, the, whatever all the evidence shows about the importance of visual fields and how we identify progression, like that's not actually happening in the real world. And so uh, my research question and the project I want to talk about today is what, what is the impact of that delay in testing? Like what, what happens because of that? And so uh, this is the, the project goal is what was the, so how long is it taking to identify progression for patients at these current frequencies? So the 25th percentile I said was about three years in between, 50th percentile was about 1.6 years in between, and the 75th percentile was about one years, 1.1 years in between. Uh, so how long would it take to identify glaucoma progression for all of those, for patients at those frequencies uh, and compare that to the, the annual testing? So to do this, we used a simulation, a simulation model um, working with uh, data from the Duke Glaucoma Registry. Uh, Felipe Medeiros, uh, one of my mentors, uh, was at Duke and had, had data for the Duke Glaucoma Registry. And so we use this data, and I don't want to get too into the simulation of it because I, I thought that might get boring. But <laughs> um, So we use the data from the real patients to add variability to uh, known uh, baseline uh, mean deviations and, and levels of progression. And then we simulate the tests and to identify how long on average it would take to identify uh, patients in these situations. So we had a few different scenarios. We did patients with uh, a baseline mean deviation of minus five or a baseline deviation of minus 10 or a baseline mean deviation of 15, minus 15. So kind of mild, moderate and severe glaucoma. And then we did two rates of progression. So uh, in these simulated patients, we're having them either progress at a uh, half a decibel per year or one decibel per year. So half a decibel is is more on the the slower rate of progression, and then one decibel per year would be would be a pretty fast re uh, rate of progression. And so we do these simulations. So if for a patient, so this is this is for patients with mild glaucoma. So for patients with mild glaucoma, if they receive testing at the twenty fifth percentile. It would, it would take, and then the time we looked at is the time to identify progression in 80% of the eyes that are progressing. So if they were progressing at half a decibel per year, it would take 18.2 years to identify progression. Um, and by the time you actually identified progression, they would have uh, lost nine decibels, which would be like really catastrophic. And that's in a patient with slow progression. If you did uh, faster progression, um, at three years, then it would be, it would take 15 years to identify progression and they would have lost 15 decibels, which would be like super, super catastrophic, super disabling. And so um, this group, patients with mild glaucoma, this is the easiest group to identify progression in because they have the le least variability. And so 20, you know, that says that, so with, with these percentiles, we don't know, you know, it's possible that, that, only patients with mild glaucoma are getting testing at the 25th percentile with three years in between tests. You know, maybe doctors are saying, oh, this patient has really mild glaucoma. We just need to do three years in between tests. Um, but even that, like for 25% of patients, like that's like incredibly not enough. If, if you got at the 50th percentile, um, they'd still be losing, by the time you identified progression, they'd still be losing six to nine decibels. 
And that's also like, so a, a loss of, it, it varies, but a loss of six decibels is definitely enough to notice and would increase disability for a patient. Like it would increase their ability to function and live their life. So that's 50% of patients, even in this scenario of like the easiest to identify. Um, at the 75th percentile, it did a little better, but still, if someone at, was getting with mild glaucoma at this testing at the 75th percentile, they'd still be losing eight decibels if they were one of those rapid progressors. And like that, that would be definitely disability. The AAO recommended frequency does uh, much better. You know, it's one year in between tests. And for patients with mild glaucoma, this, this level of loss is, is probably acceptable. Um, you know, in an ideal world, you do testing every day, but but that's not that's not really feasible. So if you look at patients with moderate glaucoma, uh, that gets that gets worse. You know, the amount of loss um, for patients ranges from like 15 decibels at the worst um, to uh, 6.3 or decibels, and then annual testing does better, of course. And then for patients with severe glaucoma. So you would hope that these patients are getting testing much more often. You'd hope that these patients with severe glaucoma aren't at the 25th or 50th percentile. But even if they're at the 75th percentile of testing, they'd still be losing uh, 7 to 10 decibels by the time you're able to identify progression. And um, these patients are starting out at minus 15. So that would be like going from minus 15 to minus 22 or minus 25, um, which is like like severe blindness. Um, and and the, even the yearly testing rec AO recommended isn't sufficient for these patients. And so the lesson from this, and I'm I'm uh, getting it submitted to publish, I, I think it's I think it's relevant data um, just to help us understand like what we're doing right now, what's happening for patients in the real world is not sufficient. They're not we're not identifying people with glaucoma progression um, for like the huge majority, you know, well over 75% of, of the patients with glaucoma aren't having the testing often enough. Um, so, uh, so one lesson from that is we need to increase the testing. We need to do it more often. And I think there's, you know, a lot of question about what to do with that. There are a lot of reasons uh, that the testing isn't done often enough. One is it's time consuming and it's kind of tedious. If you ask doctors why you don't do it often enough, you, they say because the patients hate it, um, which is true. The patients do hate it. But I will also say, like I did a qualitative project where we interviewed patients and the patients would always say, like, I hate the test, but if it's important for my vision, I'll do it. And so I actually think that the patients aren't as big of a driver as, as the doctors say it is. Um, that's something that I want to look into more. Um, but we need to do more testing. Another uh, kind of lesson from this is clinical decision support. So that's a big thing that I'm interested in is if we can provide data to the ophthalmologist and the optometrist to say, you need to do the testing this often to be able to identify progression. And unless you're doing it this often, you're going to miss this amount of glaucoma. Uh, I think that having that data um, will help the doctors and also help them talk to patients to say, yeah, this is why this testing is important. I think another potential lesson from this is that we need to work on other ways to identify um, glaucoma progression. So the Humphrey visual field is time consuming. It's expensive. Uh, it takes up a lot of space. Um, and it's hard for patients to come in, especially patients in rural areas may have to travel to do it. And so uh, I'm also working on some projects using virtual reality headsets um, to to look at other ways, you know, maybe we send virtual reality headsets to people's homes and then they can do the testing more frequently at their homes and then send them back. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities there to improve this. Um, I think uh, the bottom line is that we just need to do better for our patients to really identify um, these patients with, with rapidly progressing glaucoma. One of the hard things about glaucoma is that it's a slow moving disease that people don't notice changes to. And so if if something like you could do almost anything, you could do like, okay, we're just gonna do testing every three years. And you may never know like that there was a problem with it um, because, of, because of the way the disease behaves. 
Um, and so I, I do want to just have uh, some thank yous for this project. So Ben Brintz is the statistician who uh, helped me with the different simulation models. He He's here. And then Felipe Medeiros uh, is my mentor who's been just awesome. You know, even though I'm I'm five years out from Glaucoma Fellowship, still still helps me out from afar. And so I really appreciate that. Um, but yeah, thank you. Okay, so we are moving on to our next speaker, who's Wei Quan uh, Wendy Zhu, who uh, will be talking about the role of membrane trafficking in diabetic retinopathy and aging. And she, uh, in 2005, got her PhD in molecular biology and biochemistry at the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences and Peking Union Medical College. And she, back then she was studying stem cells and uh, heart disease and myocardial infarction. And she came to the US and actually came to Utah in 2007 where she joined Dean Lee's laboratory. And at that time she was working on acute and chronic inflammatory conditions such as sepsis, influenza, arthritis, and eye diseases. And then in 2015, she became an independent investigator and has been working on vascular biology, which she'll be talking about today, especially as it relates to eye disease. And so she's become more and more involved in eye research. She has a, she has a grant from the National, National Eye Institute and has been uh, collaborating with a number of investigators here. So in the past year, she's moved her academic home to our department. She's now in the tenure track here as an associate professor. And uh, uh, she still has her lab over in the Department of Internal Medicine. But so we wanted to introduce her here and to let her talk a little bit about her work. So Wendy, and in terms of her, she gave me two interesting facts. She said, despite after living in the US for over 20 years, she still mixes up he and she when she speaks sometimes. And she enjoys painting and practicing traditional Chinese calligraphy. So come on up, Wendy. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. I'm not only mix the he and the she and also I occasionally mix left and right. <laughs> Thank you. And I really appreciate this opportunity. And as um, Paul mentioned, I have moved from the internal medicine to uh, to Moran. And I really appreciate this kind of movement. This opens me and a door to me and, and opens um, a lot of new opportunities. Mm. Uh, today I'm going to sharing the um, going to share the work from my lab on the membrane trafficking and his role in the process of the vascular eye disease and also the aging process. And okay, today I'm going to briefly overview what the membrane trafficking is, why it is crucial for the normal function, especially in the eye or in the cells in the eye. And then followed by two examples from the work of my lab in, on how the membrane trafficking controls the VGF signaling and how it's uh, um, influenced the nitrosome function and particularly in the RPE cell aging. Um, Okay, let's start uh, discussing um, uh, the what the membrane trafficking is. So um, this picture shows a uh, animal cell. It's a simplified diagram, and we can appreciate this um, cell surrounding by the plasma membrane, and also um, inside of the cell we have this nuclear surrounded by the nuclear membrane. The space between the uh, plasma membrane and the nuclear membrane, they fill a, a lot of membrane organelles. Uh, for example, we can show, uh, see here. Oh, okay. So, and uh, see all of this ER system, Gorgi system, and we will see uh, those org membrane organelles. And those uh, organelles use the membrane to create uh, separate environment for their own function. Those function including like um, energy production, like uh, what the mitochondria will do. And also the protein synthesis, like those ER and the Gorgi system. And uh, also those membrane system involved in the uh, control the cell, how to respond to the signaling. And this is, a, as I said, this is a simplified um, 
figure. And you can find this picture in the cell signaling technology website. Mm. This shows how busy inside a cell full of those membrane systems and um, just think of it, think of it as a, a busy city. Those membrane uh, structure organelles trafficking inside of the cell, those kinds of trafficking is complicated and dynamic and um, it's tight regulated. So it's important to, for the cell to carry out their function. So those trafficking, those membrane system trafficking can like uh, simply divide it to three part when it's like uh, exocytosis and also endocytosis. And also inside, I apologize, I cannot point for you. And like inside this have this autophage and a nice song flow inside the cell. So from this picture, we see that all of this uh, movement has been controlled uh, by a group of uh, protein called small GTPS. Those small GTPS um, uh, function as a switch for this trafficking, like from where to move to which another location. Depends on their function, they can divide it to uh, different families, like um, the top last family involving signaling pathway, like cell proliferation, the left side as the raw and rack like uh, modulate the cell skeleton. And the left side of the off um, is a very nice understood family, but it's known to involve in the membrane trafficking. So in the uh, right side of the screen, uh, you will see normally each of these small GTPS has GTP bind stage and also GDP bind stage. The GTP bind stage is the uh, is its active form, and the GDP binder is the inactive form. And those kinds of GTP and GDP switch has been regulated uh, regulated by two group of protein, like the green and the GIF protein is like to active those small GTPS, and the right side is the gap to um, inactive those group of protein. So. Um, in our lab, we focus on a protein called R6, belongs to the R family. Okay, let's start with our first story, like how this R6 regulates those membrane trafficking, especially it's the VGF receptor trafficking in the endocellular cells, in the vessels. I think in, to this audience, the yeah, family with this VGF because the anti-VGF treatment has been used in the clinic for a while. And um, for a long time uh, in the cell biology field, they, they think of the internalization of the receptor after it binds into the ligand, it's, uh, its approach to terminate the signal. However, under the, this situation is not so simple. So our research indicates that, um, let's start from the left top, the receptor, the VGF receptor binding to the VGF, then move to the center and started to bind the budding and uh, internalized. This inter internalized VGF is endosome. And this interson can have two choice after it in internalized. One is go to the uh, left bottom side, go to the later interson, and a nice song to be degraded. That's a way to um, uh, ending the signal. And but also it can be like right side of this uh, signal pathway. It's this internalized interson carries this receptor can recycle back to the surface and the continuing this VGF signal pathway. So what's the rule we find about R6 in this pathway? It's, um, there are two parts, not only one. It's first, it's in this internalization um, part. This R6 involves in this activated VGF receptor internalization. This is mediated by a GIF, Coano, but however, R6 also involved 
in the other side of along this um, pathway, it's on the off to this like on the surface of the receptor. Here introduce a co-receptor for the VEGF receptor. This is called NIP1. The function of the OF6 is mediate the interaction between the VEGF receptor and its co-receptor. This activation is mediated by another GAF called GAP100. This, in, this um, receptor and the co-receptor interaction happen on the soil surface, but really function when oft those receptors internalized. The VGF receptor without the binding of the co-receptor will be sent to or connected to sent to the lysosome for degradation. But for the receptor binding to its co-receptor, the co-receptor will help it back recycle back to the cell surface. So that's mean the R6 at least in these two different locations to regulate the VGF pathway. To test those findings in the in vitro to in vivo model, we introduced the diabetes uh, in the R6 endosanial cell specific knock on mice. And we measured the vascular leakage in the retina. As we shown in the um, left, left side of the figure, and we see the left side. Uh, the Y type of these mice, we did, do see the vascular leakage in the retina. But the OF6 knockout mice has reduced this leakage. And all of this cell shows um, the right side, the very similar level of the glucose, blood glucose. That means the, redu uh, the reduce of the muscular leakage is not through the OF6 effect. The, the diabetes itself is affect the, the vasculature itself. And we have an industry partner who use this um, GTP and a GTP exchange assay to screening um, the inhibitor for the OF6. And they screen a thousand, ten thousands of the small molecule compounds and the NAP2729 be the lead compounds we find. And we use this compound in a different preclinical model for the vascular eye disease, like um, in the STZ induced type 1 diabetes in the mouse and rat to mimic diabetic retinopathy. We also tried those compounds in the ORL model and the CNV model. And this compound can um, dramatically reduce the vascular leakage and the neovascularization in those models. And okay, that's the summary for my, our first uh, story. Like um, those activated OF6 can help the VGF receptor trafficking and help the its signaling. Targeting OF6 um, can have be a potential therapeutic approach to treatment for those um, vascular eye disease. But talk to here when I present this work to other audience, a question always asked, the anti-VGF has been used for a while. What's the difference here? So then I will say, yes, um, this is up six involved in the VGF. And our mm, other project also uh, figure out like, um, OF6 also regulate like interleukin 1 beta, interleukin 6. That means OF6 also regulates those inflammation process. Um, in other system, we haven't uh, really studied those uh, in the eye system, but it have a potential this and target OF6 also not only target angiog angiogenesis, but also um, inflammation. And, uh, and another study we have now is not of six minutes also um, targets um, tissue uh, scaring, uh, scarring. So that's another potential like of anti um, target of six um, has can be applied for the like subretinal fibrosis process in the ID. This.
Okay, so that's uh, first story. Let's move to the next one, is how the membrane trafficking like particularly affect the nitrosome flow, uh, specifically in the aged RPE cell layer. Um, this, is, uh, this project initiate, was initiated by a surprise. We are not um, planned to uh, study this. Um, when we test our aged mice uh, for our multiple sclerosis project, we surprisingly find that um, those aged of 6 knock mice has improved vision function compared to their uh, siblings. So that shows us the ERG here. Um, uh, you can see the quantification over the right side, the aged knock mice has increased A wave and B wave here. Um, to identify the potential role of R6 here, we made R6 activation different part of the eye. Here we show we made R6 GTP label uh, use a uh, Western blot. And the band shows here, the darker means the higher level of R6 GTP. And we do see uh, in the middle, we see the top, we see higher level of R6 GTP in the aged RPE experiment um, there, but not in the uh, retinal part. So this experiment narrows our focus to the RPE layer. Mm, I think this audio also familiar what's the function, the key function of the RPE. I that's it uh, to support the function of the photoreceptor, like um, to supply the nutrition for the uh, photoreceptor and also remove the waste for, for it. And one of the important functions is the, the, the photoreceptor out segment of phagocytosis. Those, um, those phagocytosis move, move from the epicocyte to the bottom basal side and fuse with a nitrosome to digest those uh, components and the products like MLSA or NEPETS will recycle back to the photoreceptor. So what we find here is again use the Western blood. We sh you can see in the right side in the RPE cell have increased level of those um, uh, photoreceptor outer second membrane protein, which suggests maybe a accumulation of this um, in phagocytosis photoreceptor outer segment in the RP in the aged RPE cell. So that means in the aged one, those kinds of material recycle has been blocked. Mm. We know that. Focal, um, the outer segment phagocytosis is mediated by a ALC3 like um, mediated the, the pathway. So then we check whether the ALC3 or autophagosome has been affected in this aged uh, cell. As showing also in the uh, right side of the screen, we see the P62, a marker of the autophage also LC3B all increased. That means we it's, we, it's not the problem, we don't have enough autophage involved. We have increased or maybe accumulation of this. Then our next question is, maybe we don't have enough nitrosome, or we if we have enough nitrosome, but the nitrosome cannot fuse with this um, internalized uh, phycosome. Um, surprisingly, uh, we do find increased marker for nitrosome in those aged RPE. As shown in the um, left side of the screen, the red color shows the nitrosome. And in the aged, aged RPE, we do see increased red color shows the increased nitrosome. And also we use the Western blood to check the nitrosome membrane protein, LP1. Number one also see an increased. So this suggests we also have enough nitrosome. Then what's the next problem is whether they can fuse together. So this picture shows 
the NEMP1 is a marker for the night zone. And the, we have the C, the green and the red are not recognized. That means that's our internalized uh, photoreceptor night, uh, out segment are not fused with the night zone. We suggest maybe the normal trafficking of these two organelles maybe cannot are, are not normal, or and and then cannot confuse together, fuse to each other. Uh, interestingly, in the R six knockout aged uh, RPE cell, this accumulation of the nisosome and also RPOS has been reduced, both by the imaging also about the Western. Not only that. Of six docker or to um, reduce the those markers for the, the POS and also markers for the um, autophagy. So that's maybe explain why we see previously in the aged of six mice have improved a vision function. Okay, so that's the this project is still ongoing. And that's the part I feel comfortable to share. And um, we find the R6 activation may damage the lysosome flow in the RPE cells, and a targeting R6 can restore those function. But we still have a lot of things to do, and we uh, want to try to uh, see whether we can find a human patient relevant, also what's the detailed uh, mechanism under this. And um, also, okay, I want to conclude my talk with this image and shows that uh, trouble of a nice song and also an indoor song inside a cell. This kind of process is um, highly regulated. Um, if be overactive or dysfunctional, maybe needs related to the, the conditions like diabetes or uh, aging. And the target of six may restore this function and it can be a potential uh, therapeutic approach uh, in the future. And I want to thank you, my uh, uh, lab members who contribute this a lot, and uh, a group of um, collaborators to our different project and my funding. And happy to take questions. Mm -hmm.